have to be very careful not to mess up Eli's music here. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Pretty good. Uh, but there were a lot fewer of you at the earlier service and they were about the same volume. So let's try that again. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Much better. I'm so glad, as I said, to see all of you here this morning. It is wonderful to all be together. It's great that we gather as God's faithful people. So don't take this next question. I ask you the wrong way, okay? But why are you here? Uh, maybe the real question I'm asking you is, how are you here? How did you know to come today? And why is it important? Now, I know you're thinking, um, Pastor Heather, you're the pastor, duh, it's Easter. It's one of the most holy days we celebrate. Christ is risen, so important, hallelujah. Why wouldn't we be here? And of course, yes, I agree. Of course, that's why you're here. But when I read the Gospel of Mark today, this particular vision that's translated from the oldest authoritative texts, it says the women were afraid and told no one what they saw. So how do we find out? Have you ever thought about that? But you're here because someone, at some time, after they fled from the tomb, told someone else, or you learned the story from someone else. Now, in the other Gospels, we have a variety of people who are first there. Last night, we read the Gospel of John, and it was Mary Magdalene first, and Peter and the other disciple. In Matthew, there's an earthquake. There's a number of different things that happen. And there's an even longer version of Mark that was written a little bit after the other Gospels. So it gets a little confusing as to why there's so many accounts and, and why everything is a little different, the details... But I, you know, I don't think those details are really the point. Do you? The four Gospels may tell the story, may re recollect it a little bit differently, but they all tell the story that Jesus died on Friday and on the third day, Sunday, rose again. So the answer to my question of why are you here really rests on those facts, Friday and Sunday. And there's a deeper meaning behind that for us as well. We celebrate Christ's death and resurrection as the new covenant in his blood, the new covenant that God makes with us, that Jeremiah speaks to the people about in the prophecies we read a couple of weeks ago, the new covenant that guides what we believe happens in baptism. Speaking of baptism our Lenten theme there, the covenant that God makes with, this is the covenant that God makes with us, with each of us in baptism, and it's made possible because of the story that we celebrate today, the death and resurrection of Christ. And as we discussed during Lent, a covenant is an agreement between two or more people. It's not just a one-sided promise. A covenant is a, is a relationship with promises to each other, just like a covenant of marriage, for example. We also discussed during our Lenten season our part of our baptismal covenant, the promises we make or that someone makes for us when we are baptized. What we didn't discuss during Lent is where those promises come from. And I think it's important for us to know that know where our liturgy, the things that we say in church and the things that we sing in church, the liturgy that we do on Sundays and other holidays, those come from Scripture. Luther was emphatic that what we do and say in life and in worship come from Scripture. Thus, Lutheran liturgy comes all from Scripture. So today, I want to take a look quickly at some of the places that our baptismal covenants occur uh, in the Bible. Um, there's other verses. We're only going to do a couple today. Um, there's other verses that certainly talk about it. But we need to know, right, that what we do, why, why do we do these promises instead of 
other things. There's so many things we could do. Why do we do these? So if you'd like, you can turn in your hymnal, the very front section with all the words, not the music, to page 233, and you can follow along up at the top with the affirmation of baptism service and the promises that we make. In Acts chapter 2, we learn that the new believers in Christ would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home. They ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. So just as the early Christians did, we too live among God's faithful people. In Romans 10, Paul writes, So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. We hear the word. And in Luke 22, we read, Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We share in the Lord's Supper. In Isaiah 52 and Luke 4, we hear the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from the darkness for the prisoners. We also proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed. And in John 13, Christ himself says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash each other's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done. We are to serve all people following the example of Christ. And finally, the prophet Micah asks the people what the Lord requires of them and then answers his question by saying to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. We also strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Even in our baptismal act, the thing that we do in our sacrament comes straight from Scripture. Jesus tells us in Matthew 28, Go therefore and baptize, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that's how we still baptize today. So as we enter into this covenant with God in our baptism, these are the promises that we make or are made for us in our baptism that we affirm at our confirmation. Now, sometimes I wonder, why is it that we make these promises? What good are they if we ourselves are sinful and we can't always keep our promises? Why do we make them? We learned on Ash Wednesday that we are dust and to dust we shall return. So what good is it if we can't keep our promises? The thing is, having faith is not just about being a good person. Of course, living through these baptismal promises, we're relatively good people, but I even struggle with that term. When we say good person, it really compares us, doesn't it, to someone else, good and bad comparison. So I don't like to think about us being good people. It's not the entire point because our baptism isn't just about us. We make promises in baptism because it's a covenant, a relationship with God, and then in turn with all of our neighbors. This is why we make sure that baptism happens here publicly instead of privately when at all possible. This is why we do this at the front of the church on a, on a, on a day when everybody's here. Because our baptism is about a relationship that we have with every person gathered here with every person in the world, with God. Baptism isn't just about me being a good person. It's about me doing things to shine Christ's light in the world. We say in our baptismal service, go therefore, no, sorry, we already did that one. Um, Let your lights so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's Matthew 5, 16. So our baptism is about living in a relationship with God and with neighbor and loving one another as God has commanded us to do. And we don't promise anything in baptism without knowing that these promises are only in response to what God has already done for us. Following the Ten Commandments, upholding the things we say we'll do in baptism, all the works in the world are not what saves us. What saves us is Jesus fulfilling the law for us. Our punishment for sin is death. 
We cannot live without sinning. But Jesus comes and dies for all of us, fulfilling the law this way. And then God's baptismal covenant is new in the very thing that we celebrate today in Easter. Jesus died on Good Friday and rose again on Easter as God's new covenant. In our communion service, we hear that this is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus said that to his disciples at his last supper. What we celebrate today, though, isn't just a miracle for Jesus. It's a miracle of God's love for all of us, for you and for you and for you and for you for all of us. Christ died and rose so that we may too die and rise again with Christ when Christ comes. God so loved the world that God gave his only son that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life, which is John 3.16. And then in John 3.17, again, that no one be condemned but all may be saved through Jesus Christ. So let's go back to the gospel for today from Mark the oldest version of the story, and a rather strange ending, if you really want to know my opinion about it. You might be thinking, wait, if the women didn't say anything at all, how did anyone know what happened? But clearly, someone saw something and someone did say something, because we might not read it here, and it might be that they didn't say anything along the way, but somewhere along the line, they told someone. We don't really know how that happened. But the thing is, if they hadn't, you wouldn't be here today, and neither would I. The story was so important that it had to be told, just as the angel told them to. Since then, people have been baptized for generations. The story has been told for generations, thousands of years, because our relationship with God, this new covenant in Christ's blood, is so important. So we keep showing up. God's covenant is baptism. In baptism, through the death and resurrection of Christ, washes us clean from sin, restores our relationship with God and neighbor. God's covenant in baptism is to write it on our hearts so that we may know God. <clears throat> we are to be in relationship with God and with our neighbors. And this is way more than just being a good person, doing all the things we promised to, or even showing up today. But again, don't get me wrong. I'm still really glad you're here and that you're listening, and this is wonderful, and please come again because gathering is a good thing, right? This new covenant is made possible through the Easter miracle, and it's a covenant that binds us to eternal love, a covenant that God has made with God's people throughout the ages. This covenant God makes with us in baptism is the reason why you're here today. And Easter is the how. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.